coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Think about this. The pleasures of sin are for a season, right? But the wages of sin are death. The pleasures of sin will pull you into sin. But once you're pulled in, you don't have the authority to walk out because you've just abdicated your authority to Satan to hold you in bondage. That's why when people try to come out of sin, they fall back because they don't realize where their authority is. Satan has blinded them and stripped them like he did Adam and Eve and like he did Samson. Samson said, well, I'll just walk in there and I'll kick tail just like I did the other times. I'll shake myself and it'll be okay. But what he did not realize the fourth time he gave in to temptation and told uh, Delilah his heart is that he gave his authority over to his enemies. And when he shook himself, he did not realize the presence of God had lifted off of him and he had lost his anointing. <music>
Now, the more we read as Christians, study and implement the Word of God in our lives, the more discerning we will be about people and situations that cause us to give place to the devil unwittingly. Now, I'm going to lay some points out, and I'm going to lay a foundation, but it's to, to bring you all together into a place so that I can release what God has given me for y'all today. So just bear with me as I go through these steps and these points. The more we study, the more we get in the Word of God, the more we get that Word in our hearts by implementing that, the more it gives us power to discern both people and situations so that we do not give place to the devil unawares. Ignorance can get you hurt. It's not an excuse. The more carnal a believer is, the more readily they are to see attacks as being physical rather than spiritual. Let me say that again. The more carnal... A Christian is the more readily they are to see attacks as physical and want to fight that in the natural rather than being spiritual that's why we read that in Ephesians chapter 6 we do not war with flesh and blood but with spirits right we're to be wise as serpents yet harmless as doves now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 so as I taught last Sunday about be a spiritual Christian uh, the Lord has had me dovetail that script, that uh, sermon into part of this. And, and let's pick it up there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about being a spiritual Christian, not a carnal Christian, so that we can be about our Father's business and be effective at it. Now look there in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. And Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, one of the most carnal churches in the New Testament. And uh, it says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people. He's talking to Christians, right? Say yes, even if you don't agree. <laughs> I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now... You were not able to receive it, and, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For there, where there are uh, envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? See, that's not what Christians are about, right? We're not supposed to act like mere peop humans. We're, we're born again. We're a new creation. God has created a new, one new man in Christ Jesus neither Jew nor Gentile, right? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, uh, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so neither it is he who plants, neither is he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, it's as though many Christians hear me very clearly. I'm not talking to babes here. I'm not talking to carnal Christians. I'm talking to mature Christians, right? It is though many Christians take pride in the fact that they're not spiritual. Let me explain. Carnal Christians will resort to name-calling and belittling those who are spiritual so as to distance themselves from being perceived by the world as being a religious fanatic or insane. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not like them. Why is that? This happened with Peter. If you'll remember, Jesus says, Tonight you will die, deny me three times before the, the rooster crows. And while Jesus was being judged, Peter denied knowing Jesus and began to curse. Why did he begin to curse? To show that he wasn't spiritual to those who sought to persecute him. He was trying to fit in. Can you discern when something or someone is being used by Satan to open you up to being tempted? See, it's all coming together here. Just bear with me. If, you're, if you get in the Word of God, you allow that Word to transform you and to renew your mind, you will become spiritual. When you become spiritual, you will not see every attack 
as a human coming against you or a natural attack. Well, I have this disease. I have that disease. No, I see it as a spirit of infirmity coming against me, the temple of God. It's a spiritual battle. If I try to fight a spiritual battle in the flesh, I am shooting at the wrong target. God, help me preach. I am going after the wrong enemy. And the enemy has found this to be effective so that people get dis distracted and fight against something that they're not really, the war is not anything to do with. And they're spending all their effort, all their money, and all their stuff on, on fighting the wrong battle with the wrong people when the enemy is over here pulling all the strings behind you. But because you're not spiritually astute and you're, not, you're being carnally minded, because you don't want to become Christ-like, you don't want to be associated with Christ because of the reproach that comes on us by the world, then you won't know how to discern when something is spiritual and you'll lose the battle while being a Christian. We're fighting with, with spirits, not flesh and blood. But the enemy has found this to be a very effective wimp weapon against Christians. That's why he works so diligently in keeping Christians carnal. Let's take it a little deeper. Go with me to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, did exactly what he said he would do. In the image of God, he created him, both male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. There's the authority, right? He told them to subdue it. Bring it under subjection, right? Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I find it very interesting that God is spirit. Jesus said he is spirit, and those who worship him must what? Worship him in spirit and truth. Yet he did not create us, as, as uh, us humans, as spirits. He created us as living souls or living beings. Furthermore, God never said in these verses that he was given Adam and Eve dominion over Satan. Do you see Satan mentioned anywhere in that? Not at all. Only over animals. That's interesting. Have dominion over the animals, over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Never brings up Satan. I wonder why. He knew Satan was out there going about his roaring lion, walking to and fro, right? And God only says, have dominion over the earth, over the fish, over the birds, and over the animals. Turn with me to Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than than any what? Beast of the field. Isn't Adam supposed to have dominion over the, all the beasts of the field? God's already given him dominion over the thing that Satan's going to use. See how that slipped in? God says, I'm give, I've given you dominion over everything that Satan can use to get to you. And he said to the woman, the serpent did, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said, You will not surely die. According to Scripture, we know that Adam was with Eve during the dialogue between her and the serpent, right? Here's the downfall of man and of many Christians still today. Why did not Adam exercise his dominion over the serpent and stop him from conversing with his wife about the forbidden fruit? Why didn't he discern? See, now it's coming together, right? 
Why didn't he discern that this was a spiritual encounter and not just a a casual conversation with a snake? What made this conversation between Eve and the serpent spiritual is that he brought God and the issue of the tree of knowledge into the discussion. It it was not a, a a discussion about a tree. It was a spiritual conversation. Can you discern when you're talking to somebody the spiritual connotations of that dialogue between you and them? Because the enemy may be using them to get to you. Let me give you some for instances. You will know that you're dealing with a spiritual situation when your obedience and your commitment to God and his word are brought into question and it causes you to consider violating the word of God, sinning, or compromising your convictions. Has anybody ever intimidated you and and made you feel bad because they were uh, spiritually bullying you and causing you to want to compromise your convictions so that you could get along with them? Or maybe they had something you wanted, but you knew it was outside of God's will, but you went ahead and compromised your convictions to get it anyway? See, these are spiritual things. But many Christians cannot discern spiritual conversations, spiritual situations. Now, Satan has discovered that in an attempt to uh, seem carnal and be accepted by the world, many believers will ignore their need to become spiritually minded in this evil world. Far too many believers can't or won't exercise their spiritual authority or attempt to discern when a situation is spiritual so that they don't open their hearts up to temptation. What did this conversation cause Eve to do? It ultimately caused her to open her heart up to deception, to uh, temptation. She was deceived, yes, but she opened up the door because Adam was sitting there and standing there beside her and wouldn't say a thing. Right? Why did Satan enter the embody a serpent? And it says in Revelation 12 that it talks about the devil, the serpent of old, the dragon. So there's no bickering or dispute over. Satan embodying the serpent here in the garden and deceiving or beguiling Eve, right? What was he after? Their authority. He had none. So he says, I got to get some. Now, the point of reading the scriptures in Ephesians 6 and Genesis 1 and here in Genesis 3 is to establish from the Lord that we aren't warring with flesh and blood but with spiritual forces. This is why Satan wasn't mentioned by the Lord in Genesis 1, but the beast of the field are. Now look at Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Why didn't Adam intervene and stop the serpent? Why did he stand idly by, silently by, and do nothing. Why? It's an age-old question. Adam, why didn't you stop her? Why didn't you get something and, and run the serpent out of the garden? Why did you do nothing? Why are we as Christians doing the same thing today even though we know the consequences that it will bring upon us? Look at how great abortion has become. Where was the church in 1973? Why didn't the Supreme Court get bombarded from all over this nation and the justices on the bench hear the voices of the Christians crying out, saying, no, we will not have murder in the the, the name of choice to come and take and dominate this nation because in a few decades, there are going to be millions, not just a few people killed. There's going to be millions of babies destroyed in the name of convenience. Why? Where was the church? Where was Adam? Is this too strong? We've got to stop sitting idly by while the enemy comes in and possesses physical element, things, elements of society and comes against the church, comes against the body of Christ, comes against the word that God told us to do and tempts us so that he can take our authority from us and leave us in bondage. That day's over.
It is here that we see how Satan gained authority over mankind and was able to cause the earth to, become, to come under a curse. It is here that Adam, the one who had been given authority over the devil as long as he would uh, exercise it by stopping the beast of the field or anything else to keep them from being tempted, but he chose instead to follow his lust along with Eve, and he abdicated, surrendered, yielded his authority to the devil. Just make that point, stick it right there in your head, <laughs> and hold on to that. It was Adam who was Adam and Eve who were given the authority, right? Behold, I give you dominion over all the earth. Satan comes and gets them to submit to his will. When they submitted their will to Satan, they abdicated and yielded not only their will, watch this, they abdicated their authority to Satan. It transferred to him. I'll prove it scripturally later. Are you with me? Now, I don't know where in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, where God gives authority to the devil to do what he does in the earth. I only see where he allows God to sift Job and to sift Satan. I mean, uh, Peter. I do read where mankind has given Satan authority over us to place us in bondage because of sin and fear. As a result of Adam and Eve choosing not to be spiritually minded and then disobeying God's word, they lost their authority over the earth and their spiritual liberty. Instead of being blessed, they were under a curse of sin and death. Now, instead of having authority, they're in bondage. See what happens when we as Christians don't discern the situation. We fight things physically rather than spiritually because we don't want to obey God's word because it does not line up with our lust. And, and we abdicate our authority and then we end up in bondage just like we are in America. Now, turn with me to John 17. John 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his high eyes, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And as you have given him authority over what? All. Not some. All flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as as you have given him. In other words, there is no, mean, no man, no, no power on earth that can stop God from reaching the lost. That's what it says, right? You have given me all authority over all flesh that he may give to as many as you have given him eternal life. Not only did God send Jesus to earth with all authority, but he sent us to be our example and to show us how to walk in and exercise spiritual authority over our, our enemy. Jesus walked in authority during his earthly ministry. There was no man ever like him, before or since, like Jesus. No one and no situation was able to defy, defy his power, his wisdom, and his authority. When he spoke, his enemies fell powerless to the ground, Winds and waves had to obey his commands. Demons trembled in his presence and came out of the people in which he cast them out. The rulers of both Judaism and of Rome could not shut him down. The wisdom of the Greeks couldn't confound him. He spoke with authority and the Jews noticed it. The dead heard his voice and neither death nor the grave could hold them from rising up. There was no power. There was no demon. There was no devil. There was no governmental official. There was no news media. There was no sickness, no disease. There was nothing that could defy the power of Jesus. And there's only one reason why. God gave him all authority. That's why. Now, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. I'm giving you scripture. Everything I teach, I back it up with the word of God because it's not my opinion. It's backed on God's word, right? You've got to have something that's, that's on God's word. It's based on his word so you can stand. 
you're going to fight some devils and you need the truth to do it, right? I do not believe this word because it gives me what I want. I don't believe it because I don't get sometimes the things I think I should deserve. I believe this word because it is the truth. That's why I believe it. Even if it does not give me the results that it says it will give me, I still believe it to be true because I know that God will work all things together for my good. I may lose a battle today, but in the end I will win the war because if God be for us, who can be against us? I believe it because it's the truth, right? Give him praise in this house. He's worthy. Now, Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but, but what? He made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. See, we've got to humble ourselves when we, we become Christians. Forget that uh, identity of the world, that, that claim to fame, and humble ourselves and become... I know you've been encouraged greatly by the words thus far, but there's so much more left in this word. It takes me a while to build up to the point, but once it's released, there is some powerful things that's about to come your way next time. So be sure and mark the station and the time you're watching. Tune in next week. I would encourage you, talk to your uh, family and friends and see if they can uh, get the station that you're watching and encourage them to tune in. They can be a part of hearing all authority. Jesus has all authority, and as Christians, we're under that authority, and we have been given delegated authority. To God be the glory, because he's able to use us to do great things on the earth for his kingdom. So I get ready to leave you today. As always, I want to encourage you to send in your prayer requests and praise reports. This ministry is a lot to do with prayer, and, and we do that because we want to stay connected to God, but we also want to invite God into your circumstances and situations. If there's things that you're believing the Lord for, call us or email us. The information will be at the bottom of the screen. Our intercessors and myself pray over them, and we agree with you that God's going to do what God does best. But we've got to invite him. He's a gentleman. He waits on our invitation. He says, you have not because you ask not, so we need to ask him. And also, today, if you've been watching this uh, broadcast on a regular basis and you'd like to take that next commitment from viewership to uh, becoming a partner, we'd love to hear from you. All uh, donations are greatly appreciated. It goes straight into the television ministry, and they're tax deductible. We're a 501c3 ministry, as keys to kingdom living. And we invite you to sow into this fertile ground that gets the truth of God's word out literally to the nations of the world. As I get ready to leave you, I want to pray God's richest blessings upon you this week. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 